In 2011, the Minnesota le legislature passed a remarkable resolution that designated April as Genocide, Genocide Awareness and Prevention Month. This year, 2015, this April, we commemorate important events. It's the centennial of the Armenian Genocide, also the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Europe from Nazism, and this coming Thursday evening, Jewish communities across the globe will mark Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. At the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, we see these anniversaries as a valuable opportunity to raise awareness, to advance scholarship and education, to encourage students, educators, also members of the broader community to deepen their understanding of the events and their sequels, and to reflect upon the moral and political questions raised by the atrocities as we outline today's work. In this spirit, we have organized today's event. And I would like to thank Judith Schengar for honoring the center and the University of Minnesota with the gift of this lecture tonight. We are privileged to have you. Thank you to all who have contributed to make this event possible. The Weizmann Art Museum, thank you for hosting us. The Department of Art History, the Center for Austrian Studies, the Center for Jewish Studies, Minnesota Hillel. I would also like to thank Jennifer Hammer, our fantastic program associate at the Center, and as always, the outstanding events team at the Institute for Global Studies, who are organizing right now chairs for everyone, everybody to be seated. Thank you to Johnny Sussman as well for <coughs> Uh, helping us uh, with the event flyer and a very special thanks for Judith Imber who has been invested and, and, in, and invested and enthusiastic partner throughout the process of organizing this important event and I would add to that that without Judith we wouldn't be here tonight. We are also thrilled and honored to have in this room today many friends and supporters of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies who make events such as this one today possible. Now it is my pleasure to invite to the podium Lyndall King, Director and Chief Curator of the Wiseman Art Museum. Thank you again for having us here tonight. It's my great pleasure uh, to introduce my friend, Yudit Shindar, who recently retired from a 17-year tenure at Yad Vashem, Israel's National Holocaust Commemoration Authority, where she held the positions of Deputy Director of Museums Division, Senior Art Curator, and Director of the Holocaust Art Museum. In a certain sense, we're glad to welcome her home. In a very real sense, we're glad to welcome her home because she received her MA in Art History and Museology from the University of Minnesota. And she was a curator here at the Wiseman Art Museum before it was the Wiseman Art Museum. <laughs> Long time ago, so welcome back. We're really glad to have you here tonight. She um, was the recipient, has been the recipient of many scholarships uh, from Israel America Education Foundation, the Goethe Institute, and many other organizations. She uh, has also served as a curator, chief curator, and director in major museums in Israel and abroad, the Haifa Modern Art Museum, the Yanko Dada Museum, the National Maritime Museum, Museum in Haifa, and of course, here at the Wiseman. She's lectured in many places, including the Technion, the renowned Israel Institute of Technology, and at the Classical and Near Eastern Studies Department here at the University of Minnesota. She's uh, quite sought after in seminars and conferences in Israel, Europe, and the US on the subject of confronting Holocaust art. She founded the International Holocaust Art Research Center, which consists of an archive of Holocaust art, library of Holocaust art, and the Center for Documentation of Nazi Looted Art as well as a traveling exhibition at Yad Vashem, which is their overseas education endeavor, allowing worldwide audiences to deepen their understanding of the show. She was the force behind the implementation 
of a unique integration of artworks into the historical narrative at Yad, Muse at Yad Vashem's Museum of the History of the Holocaust. This approach charted a new and innovative approach in the design of Holocaust Museum exhibitions, giving art an appropriate role of witness accounts of the events, adding the victim's emotional and visual perspective. She's, of course, an author of a great number of books, essays, and catalog on contemporary art as well as Holocaust period art. And in light of her special interest and knowledge in the realm of Nazi looted art, she was recently appointed to the International Task Force of Experts, working on the provenance research of the Cornelius Gerlich art cache found in Munich, Germany. And uh, this is her retirement, shall we say, her retirement project, <laughs> keeping her busy, keeping her researching, keeping her traveling. And she and I have also been talking about reviving a few, uh, a few uh, projects that we actually uh, got up to together when she was here at the Wiseman. So who knows what might happen in the near future. Welcome to the podium, Judith. I'm so honored and very, very excited to see so many faces I know from the many years I spent in this city. So, in a way, I'm reaping now a, a great success by seeing you here with me. And um, I would like to start with some words which I said it's a problem, but definitely before everything, I need to say thank you to Alejandro on the way back there, who invited me for this lecture and uh, have Linda joined in this endeavor and all the departments at the University of Minnesota Art History, the Center of Austrian Studies, German and European Studies, Jewish Studies, and ILM, who all graciously enlisted to co-sponsor this event. And very, very special thanks to a dear friend of mine. She is sitting here with us, Judith Inger, and as Alejandro said, she was the mover and shaker of this event, and I'm thankful to her. I would like to have a short prologue. It was the early 70s, the Art History Department at the University of Minnesota. Two graduate students registered for a seminar with Professor Melvin Waldfogel, whose special field of interest was 19th century French and German painting. Who could have imagined how poignant this would become four decades later? I believe this is where Lindo and I met for the first time. Yes, indeed. This was 40 years ago. However, I clearly and fondly remember other members of the art history department who two were my teachers, Michael Stoughton, Sheila McNally, Rick Escher. They have no doubt instilled within me not only the knowledge of an art historian, but even more so, an elusive a passion for art and what it can do for society. So dear Lindo, I believe that the graduate program on this campus is where our two flourishing careers in the museum world have started. And I would like to thank you for the friendship and collegiality that we have shared for the four decades, and hopefully, as you said, with some future mutual endeavors still to come. November 5, 2013, headlines in major newspapers world over read as follows. Paintings discovered in Germany 
Hundreds of forgotten artworks were found hidden in the Munich apartment. Picasso, Matisse, Dix, among works found in Munich's Nazi art trash. Stash. <laughs> <laughs> the unfinished art business of World War II. Shortly after these headlines appeared, the full picture unfolded. Apparently, on 22nd of September, 2010, customs officials carrying out a routine inspection searched Cornelius Gorlitt on a train trip from Zurich to Munich. They discovered about 9,000 euros in cash in his attaché case. Even though this was below the legal limit for carrying cash into the country, alarm bells rang. And an investigation in Munich commenced. My personal feelings are that someone must have tipped off the authorities. When searching the Bavarian state's tax records, Gurlitt's name did not come up. He was subsequently suspected of having committed tax evasion for his entire adult life. <laughs> the next day, September 23rd, 2010, the district court in Augsburg grants the public prosecutor a search warrant and seizure order for the apartment of Cornelius Gorley in Munich. As part of the request, the public prosecutor's office in Augsburg applies also for a search warrant for Cornelius Gorlitz's residence in Salzburg. However, this application is denied. Only a year and a half later, apparently, the Germans were in no rush. On February 28th, and continuing through March 2nd, 2012, the apartment of Cornelius Gorlitz in Munich in the borough of Schwabing is searched. Removing artworks had taken a full three days and they were moved to a safe location. According to the public prosecutor's office in Augsburg, the law enforcement officer secured about 1,400 objects as evidence, including 121 framed and 1,285 unframed works of art. All these procedures are kept out of the public eye. The authorities later explained that due to the presumption of innocence applicable in criminal investigations, including those relating to tax matters, and because police inquiries are not subject to public disclosure, the case was not made public. <laughs> November 3, 2013, first press report in the German news magazine Focus discloses to the world the Gorlitz operation. Until that moment, under a tight lid, titled The Nazi Treasure, the elaborate article describes the Bavarian customs, discovery of some 1,500 works by artists such as Picasso, Chagall, and Matisse, which were confiscated during the Third Reich, and were found in the apartment of 80-year-old Cornelius Gorlitz, the son of an art historian and art dealer Hildebrand Gorlitz. Focus reported that Bavarian customs are now in the possession of the paintings. November 4, 2013, realizing the repercussions of such a sensational discovery by the world community, a government spokesperson confirms that the federal German government was made aware of the case a few months prior until this point, the case was apparently being treated by the Bavarians as a mere 
tax evasion case. <laughs> Charges subsequently were disclosed to Chancellor Angela Merkel, who learned of the discovery and did not make it public. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. November 5th, 2013. Under world pressure and the federal government, the public prosecutor office in Augsburg convenes a press conference and releases details to the press pertaining to the art road found in the apartment in Munich, Borough of Schwabing, from now on known as the Schwabinger Kunstbund. While previously reports has emphasized the messy conditions inside the Gorli flat, the customs officials insisted that most of the pictures had been stored professionally and were in good condition. Only a couple of paintings had been slightly dirty. Gorlit had taken no particularly unusual measures to safeguard his flat from intrusers. Keeping things secret is the best way to keep them safe, said the Munich customs official, Siegfried Klöbel. It was also disclosed that Cornelius Gorlit has sold a Max Beckman painting to Cologne Auction House in September 2011 after the seizure of the content of the Munich apartment, inviting speculation that he had another hidden stash of artworks. Gurlit, who is an Austrian national, owns another property in Salzburg, but Klöbel said the existence of more hidden artworks was unlikely. The mystery around Gurlit himself, meanwhile, had thickened the whereabouts of the 80-year-old are not known, said the customs authorities. <coughs> when asked by the journalist if Gorlit was still alive, Augsburg Chief Prosecutor Reinhard Nemeth said he could not comment. <laughs> Michael Hoffman, a world-renowned scholar on degenerated art from the Free University of Berlin, who was called to make a survey of the found cache, cash, attested to the fact that Bavarian authorities were well aware of the content of the trove. And she said, the world will be particularly excited about the discovery of valuable Matisse painting from around 1920 and works that were previously unknown or unseen. An Otto Dixon portrait dated around 1919, and a Chagall gouache <coughs> painting on of an allegorical scene with a man kissing a woman wearing a sheep's head and a Matisse seated woman. 11th of November 2013, the German authorities, state, and federal realizing that their conduct was clearly harming Germany's reputation as complying with the Mark Washington, Vilnius, and Prague International Agreement on Art Restitution, decided to establish an international committee, the Schwabing Art Road Task Force. Dr. Ingeborg Bergen-Merkel is appointed director of the task force. Her first job is to assign an international group of experts to conduct the provenance research. The Gorlit Art Trove is drawing attention of potential claimants of the art, art historians, art critics, private and national art institution agencies, museums, galleries, the World Jewish Congress, the Jewish Claims Committee, Israel's Hashavah Institution Agency, members of the Knesset, and my personal dear friend, Bobby Brown, <coughs> director of Project Heart, an organization working directly with leaders of European countries in an effort to address the complex issues 
related to restitution of Jewish private property seized by Nazi forces. <coughs> Allow me now a small digression. A short while before all this transpired, during a schmooze session with my friend Bobby, I found out that his father escaped from Germany in 1938 in one of the now known kinder transports. He was born in the tiny town of Battenberg, Hessen. <coughs> According to Wikipedia, the house of Mount Batten is a European dynasty, originally the Battenberg family. That was their name, but because of rising anti-German sentiments after World War I, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, the son of Princess Alice of Battenberg and grandson of the first Marquis of Wilkford, took the anglicized name Mountbatten. Because mm -hmm. Battenberg means Mount Batten. Mm -hmm. When he became a British citizen, in Battenberg lived 50 Jews in 1839 and 22 by 1933. It also happens to be the same town, my grandmother's Irma, only brother, many, and his wife, Alma, and three daughters, Margot, Irene, and Gertrude lived. In this very house on 44 Eda Kala Straße, ironically, until these very days, it's named the Jews' house. The Leerbergers were all transported in 1941 to Riga, Latvia. The first cousins of my mother, Margot, Irene, and Gertrude, ages 19, 14, and 9, respectively, were murdered with their parents by the Nazis for no other reason than their being Jewish. They are not lost in oblivion for mentioning their name here and now is my modest homage to their memory. Now back to Babi, who presses the point that we Jews and Israelis have to become part of the task force and inquires if I would be willing to serve. Truthfully, I succumb to Babi's pressure, quite sure that the Germans will not act upon it. Well, Babi wrote, and Babi got a positive answer in retrospect, no surprise. Who else would be most appropriate to enlist but representatives from the State of Israel? Some maneuvering of ministerial and governmental offices put a request in front of Yad Vashem's chairman, Avner Shalev, to authorize the appointment. It was December 213, <coughs> while all of this was going on, I was in the U.S. celebrating Hanukkah with my kids in California when a call arrived from Yad Vashem <coughs> Chief Operating Officer Dorit Nova. Yehudit, I have the perfect job for you upon your retirement. <laughs> the requirements call for the following. An art historian, well versed in the annals of the Shoah, well versed in Nazi looted art, and in command of the German and English languages. This fits your life and love, and it's yours. <laughs> By the end of March, I was to retire from my 17-year tenure at Yad Vashem, which my close friends never believed would happen. <laughs> they were right. My new job was already formulated. <coughs> Fourteenth of January, two thousand and fourteen, Cornelius Gorlit announces that three lawyers have been assigned to take care of his affairs. They in turn announce that they have filed charges against unknown persons for leaking confidential information to the public, originating in documents related to the investigation. And several days later, they announced that they filed charges with the Augsburg District Court 
against the seizure order. 28th of January 2014. Once the formal requirements have been clarified in Germany and overseas, the team appointed to the International Task Force is announced to the public. My name is revealed to the world. Our first task force meeting is scheduled to meet February 13th in Munich. The chief of the objective of the task force is clarified to us was to research the provenance of the artworks on behalf of the Augsburg public prosecutors. The clarification of the provenance of the artworks is intended to assist the prosecution's investigation as to whether these works legally and rightfully belong to Cornelius Bullitt. We are to submit our findings to the prosecutor's <coughs> office, who solely will be in charge of the legal process handled by the Bavarian state. With regard to the publication of details and findings of the task force, such disclosure is subject to the strict legal prohibitions concerning criminal investigators. Thus, all of us, the members, are bound by confidentiality agreements, which I signed and am still bound by. We inspect the location where the artworks are being stored and view several of the most notable artworks. In retrospect, I've learned that every meeting of our task force was to be preceded or followed by some new scandalous occurrences. Headlines of world major papers two days prior to our meeting in February 2014 announced Nazi art collector Cornelius Gorlitt found to have more words at his Austrian home. Remember the said there was no chance. <laughs> no fine may bring Nazi painted art road to two <coughs> billion dollars. Zach's work, Astash, more important than Munich, works by Renoir, <coughs> Monet, and other French impressionists. <coughs> the legal representatives of Cornelius Gorlitt announced that further artworks have been found in Cornelius Gorlitt House in Salzburg. The Salzburg collection encompasses a total of 238 works, 39 of which are all paintings. The official disclosed that the Zaltzburg house had already been seen searched in the past, but claimed that the artworks in the part of the house that was previously not accessible <laughs> were informed that these newly discovered words are not assigned to our task force for further inspection, and they were not part of the court-ordered Munich seizure. The more dramatic part of the announcement of Bullitt's legal counsel entails the fact that Cornelius Bullitt is now prepared to return all works identified as looted art to the descendants of their legal owners. A team is appointed by his guardian to research the provenance of the works from Salzburg. Now there are two teams. The Bavarian State Appointed Team, which I am part of, working on the Munich Cash, the Task Force, and Gorlitz Team working on the Salzburg Cash, two separate roles, two separate teams. Merely another month and a half pass on, on April 7, no headlines are in the world press. Now the read. Breakthrough? Gorlitz signs agreement with Germany for continued research and commits to return of art. Cornelius Gorlitz signs an agreement with the Federal Republic of Germany and the Free State of Bavaria, according to which the task force will continue to research the provenance of artworks suspected of unlawful appropriation. <laughs> Even when the seizure order expires, Cornelius Gurlitt acknowledges and accepts the Washington principles 
and they apply to his situation. This means that once theft has been proven, fair and just solutions, in particular, restitution would be sought. The agreement also states the statute of limitation does not apply and bears no relevance to the Schwabing Quartal. That's very important. Legal hurdles having been cleared, it was time to start working on the research, which was divided between the German research team and the international task force. It is May 6th, and Israel is celebrating its 67th Independence Day. I am at home and open my computer to browse leisurely when the following internet alert pops at my eye. Hoarder who hid looted Nazi art dies at 81. Ownership of the one billion hoard of masterpieces thrown into doubt. Everybody's dead. Now what? What will be the fate of the task force? As stipulated by law, his property rights, if any, and the prosecutor's investigation come to an end. The Munich District Court announces that Cornelius Gorlit has written a will, witnessed by a notary in Baden-Württemberg. The probate court now has to inform the beneficiaries who have been named in the will. Beneficiaries living abroad have six months to decide whether they will accept the request or not. <coughs> Further details about his will are not provided. The content of his testament is strictly confidential. 7 May 2014, the Kunstmuseum Bern issues a statement saying that he has been informed by Cornelius Gorlitz's executor on the telephone and in writing that the Kunstmuseum Bern Foundation has been appointed the sole beneficiary to Cornelius Gorlitz's estate. With reference to the district court, the press reports that Cornelius Gorlitz wrote his will on January 1st, 2014, mm. which was further substantiated by a revised will on the 21st of February, 2014, merely two months before his death. The Kunstmuseum Bern states that the board of the Kunstmuseum Foundation is dealing with all issues related to the Gorlitz request. July 1st, 2014. Our second meeting of the task force convenes in Berlin. While still unsure what the future holds with the Bern, we continue business as usual. However, we are informed that a box with 33 additional objects that had been secured by the probate court from Cornelius Gullick's Munich estate after his death will be added to our investigation as to their provenance. They include, among others, a beautiful marble sculpture by Auguste Rodin and a bronze sculpture by Lila. Our task seems to grow by the hour or by the month. 5 September 2014. The administrator of Gorlit Estate submits yet another artwork to the task force, a light blue landscape painting completed around 1864, according to experts. It is probably Monet's garden at Saint Adresse. Apparently, upon being admitted to the hospital in Ludwigsburg, southern Germany, in December, to treat a serious heart condition, and when he also signed the will request, requesting the works to the Kunstmuseum, Cornelius Borley brought with him 
in a little suitcase a painting. The cage which was left at the hospital after his release, merely a few weeks before his death at the age of 81, was only now found. The press, saturated by now with a Gorlitz scandal, did little with this information. <coughs> to the team of experts, however, it was, it was an affirmation that Hazel Brown's Gorlitz son, Cornelius, was not an innocent recluse. Rather, just like his father, he was a cunning swindler almost to his last days of living. It is time for our third task force meeting in Berlin, scheduled for November 26. And on the day of our first meeting, just across the street in Dorotheenstrasse in the Federal Press Office, representative of the Kunstmuseum Bern announced that the museum will accept the bequest. <laughs> the chairman of the board of the Bird Foundation, Professor Dr. Schäuberlin, the Federal Commissioner for Culture and the Media, State Minister Professor Monica Kruters, and the Bavarian Minister for Justice, Professor Dr. Winfried Bausbeck, signed a tripartite agreement. That Salzburg fine will only be handed over to the task force after the Kunstmuseum Bern conducts its initial, I'm sorry, initial research into whether the artworks may have been looted. The actual restitution of artworks will be undertaken by the federal German German government. It was also agreed that works that will be identified as having been confiscated, but for which no claim has been filed, will remain in the Federal Republic of Germany. This also applies in the case of artworks, the provenance of which remains inconclusive. For works classified as degenerated art, where there is no suspicion of theft or unlawful for confiscation, the respective museums in Germany, Austria, and Poland will be granted preferential lending conditions. So now, the task force operates under a tripartite agreement and assume Bern is to be our future bus. Nothing remains constant for long in this undulating tale. We learn that there is a dispute over the world which Cornelius Gorlitz bequest to the Kunstmuseum Bern. Uta Werner, one of Gorlitz's cousins, filed a petition under German law hours before the museum's announcement, calling the will into question and challenging the institution's rights to the inheritance. Werner, along with another cousin, Dietrich Gorlitz, have attempted to call into question their relative's mental state at the time <laughs> and ordered to have a psychological evaluation based on his final letters, document, and evaluation which paints a picture of the late wallet as a vulnerable, paranoid, and schizophrenic person. The evaluation also notes that Gurlitt was convinced that the National Socialist Network was following him in order to get access to his art collection. Yes, he was paranoid at the end. Cornelius kept no connection with his cousin. In the only interview he gave to the Spiegel magazine, he said, throughout my entire life, life I loved nothing more than my paintings. While the legal era is still undecided by the court, our fourth meeting is scheduled for March 12, 2015 in Berlin. By the way, latest update by March 24 is that the Bern Museum is declared the rightful and sole owner by the Munich court. 
Are we finally clear of all obstacles in this never-ending roller coaster? The morning meeting reveals a very edgy doctor in the board, Bergen Merkel. Soon we are to learn why. The Zoo Deutsche Zeitung, a Munich-based paper, has a new scandal in the end. This morning, headlines read, the Connie Leaks. Cornelius, Connie Leaks. It was announced that the document that belonged to Cornelius Gorlitz's father, a Nazi-era art dealer, Hildebrand Gorlitz, have been digitized and will be made available online in the very near future. The, not, the documents from the Gurlitt estate include letters, photographs, business correspondence, photographs of the artworks. The immense scope of data is estimated to be over 25,000 digital pages. The first files will be leaked in the next few days and documents are going to be released continuously throughout the year. Well, we are shocked, for we all are going to be criticized for not doing our job and keeping our work away from the public eye. This until now hidden cache of data has indeed indescribable implications pertaining to the provenance research we are conducting. We have been searching in the dark <coughs> while the flashlight was in somebody else's hands all this time. Where did it come from? Who removed it without authorities' knowledge? Apparently the funds in questions were removed from Gurlitz Villa in Zandsburg mm. just before his death. And the processing of the material stopped when he died. The Bern Museum Task Force should have been approached, but someone had in mind a different scenario, namely some blackmailing scheme, a money for documents deal which was offered and rejected. The full details remain undisclosed, however, but I learned last week that the documents were forwarded to the task force and are now currently digitized for our future use. Are you intrigued as to their content? So are we, for it may shed light on many of our unsolved riddles and hopefully allow us to accomplish what we toiled for, the restitution of artworks to the legal Jewish owners in a timely manner. The insatiable pursuit of art is our mandate. By March 22nd, 2015, the first restitution was announced by the federal German government following the task force recommendation for the return of art from the Gurli Trove. Cultural Minister Monika Grutus signed the agreement, the first such accord for a piece from the Gurli collection. The agreement still has to be cleared by the Munich court handling Wurlitz inheritance. The painting by Max Lieberman, Two Riders on the Beach, was seized under the Nazi rule from David Friedman. Two Riders on the Beach was seized, I'm sorry, a businessman from Breslau. The claimant and the rightful owner confirmed, confirmed by our research is 90-year-old David Torn born in 1925 as Klaus Günther Tarnowski in Breslau. His father was a well-respected lawyer named Georg Tarnowski, whose great uncle was David Friedman. Lieberman's equestrian painting had hung in the conservatory of the Friedman's villa. Torren remembers well how it enchanted him as a child the pretty horses, the churning sea. Torrin saw his great uncle in the painting for the last time in November 1938, a day after Kristallnacht. Torrin's father, who also Friedman's lawyer, 
was asked to finalize the sale of all Friedman's art possessions to the Nazi general. Torin was there and waited. His parents were deported to Auschwitz and murdered. After having brought both of the sons to safety, he, the younger one, made it to Sweden on one of the last Kinder transports on August 2, 1939. His brother traveled to Holland and then to England one day before the war broke out. They escaped, they escaped with their lives and nothing else. David Friedman was a widower and died natural death in 1942. His only daughter, Charlotte, was deported and murdered in Auschwitz, 1943. Jewish artists and Jewish collectors were destined to the same fate. Max Liebermann, the celebrated German Impressionist, died at the age of 85 in Berlin, defamed and an outcast. His paintings removed from all German public spaces. When his widow, Martha, was summoned to her assigned Theresienstadt bound transport to the so-called old age home, she committed suicide in the Berlin Jewish Hospital. In a recent interview, David, David Torrance said, if I and my relatives get the Lieberman painting back, it will, it will not rectify anything. But if we don't, it would mean that nobody has learned anything. Mm -hmm. Each restitution case we research indeed involves major works of art, the kind that are written in the European art history textbooks, but no less confronts the fate of Jewish art collectors and their families during the Third Reich. So how did Cornelis Gulli end up with this piece and the rest of his amazing trove? In describing the plunder of art by the Third Reich in his book, Nazi Looting, Gerald Alders writes, never in history has a collection so great been amassed with so little scruple. Nazi art looting endeavors are not to be perceived as a minor digression in the final solution of the Third Reich's anti-Jewish strategies, but rather as a well-orchestrated operation at the highest levels of Nazi hierarchy and an integral part of the racist policies against the enemies of the Reich. This was an act defined by the Nazi leader as high national priority and a high national one to be achieved. The primary players behind the Nazi plunder of art were Hitler and Goering. <coughs> Hitler regarded the plunder as the agent to realize his dream of building a museum in Linz, Austria to represent the greatness of the German Reich. <clears throat> in the town of his birth, its aim was to demonstrate to the world the wealth and culture of the Third Reich. This passion for his quest constituted the most virulent incentive for his subordinates. The national character of Hitler's collection is also evidenced by a provision of his last will and testament in which he states, the paintings that the collection I purchased over the years were never collected for private purpose, but only for the museum in the city of my birth place. If Hitler collected art for nationalistic reasons, Goering did this for his personal pleasure. His quest was to establish an art museum, Karina Hall, a memorial for his beloved deceased Swedish wife, Karin Gräfin von Folk. <coughs> After whom the estate was named, he dedicated his art collection to her 
as a token of appreciation for following to Germany at a time we had, we had nothing to offer her. Karin died of an illness in Sweden in 1931, and when the Nazis rose to power in 1933, Göring brought her body to Karina Hall, where he was to be, which was to become a mausoleum. <laughs> Hermann Göring played the most crucial role in art confiscation via the establishment in 1940 of the Rosenberg Institute for Occupied Territories, renamed to Einsatzstadtreich Leiter Rosenberg, Task Force Rosenberg, or as we now term it, ERR in short. Its original role was to collect Jewish and Freemasonic books and documents in the newly Eastern occupied territories, either for destruction or for removal to Germany for further study. After the capitulation of France in May of 1940, Wehrmacht Air Force Chief Hermann Göring issued an order that effectively changed the mission of the ERR mandate it to the following. Seize Jewish art collections and other objects. Charged with the appropriation of cultural property, the ERR was the most proficient of all the arms of the Third Reich involved in the confiscation and looting of property and was directly responsible for the plunder of over 21 thousand artworks for more than 200 art collections belonging to Jewish owners. Alfred Rosenborg testified to the ideological nature of the Nazi plunder of art at the Nuremberg trials. When asked to explain how the actions of his until during the war were any different from looting, he replied, the seizing works of art was the policy of the Reich. It would have been theft if he had taken them privately. His unit was charged with the custody of enemy property for the purpose of conscience and the protection of cultural assets. With Göring's new directives in 1940, Paris art collections from prominent Jewish families, including the Rothschild, the Rosenbergs, the Wildensteins, and the Hamburgs, were the targets of confiscation because of their significant value. Jewish art dealers sold art to German dealers under the forced sale procedure a sale under duress. These practices were soon to be followed on German soil, targeting prominent Jewish collections, the likes of Paul Kassira, Alfred Fleschheim, Fritz Glaser. <coughs> the collections would later be sold openly by auction houses in Berlin and Dresden for a fraction of their true value. In April 45, Paul Rosenberg returning from his refuge in the U.S. writes, we, we recovered some paintings looted by the Germans or by dishonest Frenchmen, but I'm not going to complain. It is as nothing when you look at the horrors that the Nazis inflicted on human beings of all races. Linz was to be the site of Hitler's massive Führer Museum. It was never built. And yet, the Nazis bought enough art to fill three museums. Hermann Foss, director of the prestigious Dresden Art Museum, ran the art buying program. Hildebrand Gurlitt worked for Hitler through Foss, who served as a middleman. He also bought art for German museums that had been brought in line by the regime, as well as for private citizens like Hamburg cigarette manufacturer Hermann Retzma, Hanover chocolate magnate 
Bernard Sprengel, and Cologne attorney Josef Haubrich. Paris, under the new growing guidelines, became the epicenter of the action. When Captain Robert K. Posse and his assistant, Private Lincoln Kirstein, known as the Monument Man, inspected the Ashbach Castle, property of the local Kölnit family in early May, they were faced with an enormous art warehouse. It contained paintings and sculptures from the museums in nearby Bamberg, the German city of Kassel, which happens to be my mother's birth birthplace, whose directors had sought to protect the works from Allied bombing. They also discovered suspicious private property, some 13 art crates marked as belonging to Hilbert Futenberg, the former commander of the German Air Force Division of Bodinia, and the estate chapel contains suitcases and bags full of art, which Evel von Kleist, the former Wehrmacht commander, had left there, and boxes marked with the names of Haberstock and Gorlitz, Captain Posse declared the estate a restricted area and had signs reading off limits posted at the property. Daily reports of the castle read the following. Castle of Ashbach, 16th of May, 45. Present at the castle were the owner and his son, and also Mr. H. Borlitt, a dealer from Hamburg with many Nazi connections, who has made many trips to France on behalf of the Nazi officials. He worked also for Karl Haberstock. All of them are known, they were dealing with art in Europe for their own ruthless and brutal methods in acquiring the art objects all of them for Hitler. So now we are for the first time our American monuments man on the scene arriving at the Ashbach. The monuments man questioned Hildebrand Gorlit in Ashbach in June of 1945. They noticed that he seemed extremely nervous and that he seemed as if he were not telling the whole truth. It was during those days that Gourlit, the art dealer to the Fuhrer, reinvented himself as a victim of the Nazis, a man who had saved precious artworks from destruction and someone who had never done anything malicious. On June 10, 1945, a sworn statement written by Dr. Hildebrand Gourlit says, life history, Comment on his brother. He says his brother had Jewish blood. And if it was up to the Nazis, he would have been put into a concentration camp. Reading this, I was asking myself, could be that Hildebrand Gullit is not telling us the truth. So I decided to track the family's annals. And I found that Hildebrand Wurlitz's grandmother, Elizabeth Wurlitz, was born to David and Zipora Marcus. <coughs> no question, they are good Jewish names. They were from Königsberg. Königsberg. However, during their life, they Germanized their name to Levan. Funny label, who you see here, his great aunt, became a most famous writer and feminist. A prominent street in Dresden bears her name until this very day. I wonder if anyone today is aware of her Jewish roots. In November 1945, the Americans were about to establish a camp for displaced persons in the Ashbach Castle. 
Survivors of the Holocaust, many, not even 20 years old, were to reside there. And thus, on October 7, 45, the Office of the Military Government of Ashbach area dispatches a letter saying that the castle should be cleared of its inhabitants. On March 4, 1947, a document titled Some Required Explanations, written by Cornelius Gorlitt. All my boxes were inspected by the American Force Forces. All paintings coming from France and also some from Germany were hauled off in open boxes, first to Bamberg and then to Collection Point Wiesbaden. What was left in Ashbach were only my books, degenerated art prints, and a few paintings. They were inspected in February 47 and qualified as okay. I've never hidden anywhere artworks. The boxes contain art history books only, nothing of any value, only used books. All artwork objects found in the Ashbach Castle were transferred by the Monuments Man Unit to the Collection Point Wiesbaden. At the cessation of hostilities in May 45, a number of temporary collecting points were set up by the 12th Army Group to store all cultural objects found in the U.S. zone in need of preservation or suspected of having been looted by the Germans. By 1946, only four of the collecting points remained and were located in Munich, Wiesbaden, Marburg, and Offenbach. The Wiesbaden Central Collecting Point held mostly German-owned material, especially that of the former Prussian State Museum, plus a certain amount of material confiscated from German nationals, like our dear Gorlitz. At its height, this installation contained approximately 700,000 objects. The seized Gorley trove reached the CCP by spring 45 and was followed by the interrogation as to the origin of the art found in the Ashbach Castle. On the declaration of property from June 18th in Wiesbaden, Gorley states, with some signs where the works of art came from, his father, his grandfather, the artist, his friends, everything was lawfully his and should remain his. The Munich and Wiesbaden closed in August 51, although some cultural objects remained. When the US decided to close the place, <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. The property division were retired to an army record center in Kansas City until they were accessioned into the National Archive in the early 60s. This is now the full three narrow files where each one of you can tap into and find some of the objects and documents I've quoted here. On December 13, 1950, less than a year before the closure of the Wiesbaden collection point, in accordance with the demand by the American authorities to clear the place, Hildebrandt attests again and swears that all the works of art are his and were legally acquired, given, or bought by him. The last document in this succession is dated January 25, 1941, at the time of the clearing of the premise, originating from the office of the High Commission for Germany. It is a release to owner form signed by Thomas C. Howey, Cultural Affairs Advisor, who signed representing the American Party and a man named Ernst Groh, employee of a transporting corporation 
representing Hildebrand Gurlit. Yes, the Gurlit collection of Ashbach was returned to its legal owner by the Americans. I know your first reaction is going to be, gosh, those naive Americans. They bought all the lies in the brand Gurlit has provided. How gullible can one be? The monument men in Ashbach felt that Haberstock was the more gregarious criminal. He was taken into investigation custody already in May 45. <coughs> Haberstock himself later told German officials that Americans had underestimated Gurlitz's role during the Nazi period. In 49, in a letter to a government official, he wrote, I was able to prove everything, including, for example, that I was not the main supplier for lint. Whereas Mr. Foss, during his short term in office, bought 3,000 artworks and took them over, confiscated collection, together <coughs> with his main buyer, Dr. Hildebrand Gurlit. However, I would like to remind the audience the numbers entailed, namely 700,000 objects in this Baden collection point only. The final report of the <laughs> Art Looting Investigation Unit of the American War Office, dated May 1st, 46, provides an indication and to the scale of this plunder. Francis H. Taylor, director of the time, at the time of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, reported that the Nazi that had stolen European art treasures valued at the time at two billion dollars, which is more than the total value of other works of art in the United States. In the six years following the end of the war, the Americans honestly attempted to do justice. The failure to accomplish this, this huge task under the circumstances can in retrospect be well understood and the laborious and serious attempt should be acknowledged and appreciated. In describing the plunder of art by the Third Reich, it has been said, never in history has a collection so great been amassed with so little scruple. This was the stage where Hildebrand Gurlit Cornelius' father played a rather small role which nonetheless yielded a throne estimated today at a close to two billion dollars. The task force and its international experts are attempting to amend past mistakes. And to do justice unto the owners and their descendants, seven decades after the end of the World War II, this is not a simple task. <coughs> Where books are being burned, human beings are destined to the same, wrote the German Jewish writer Heinrich Heine in 1821 in a play about a feud between Muslims and Christians. Not realizing his books would be burned by the Nazis in the bonfires ignited by Joseph Gilbert in 35, almost a century later. I will close this presentation with a paraphrase, where art is confiscated by state racial policy, human beings are destined to be murdered. <laughs>